Welcome. I'm Harmony Slater, your host of the Finding Harmony podcast. Over the past 20 years, I've taught thousands of yoga teachers and students to explore the intersection between ancient wisdom and modern everyday life, using mind-body practices to heal, awaken, and manifest their dreams from the inside out. This podcast is a sanctuary for those feeling overwhelmed by life's challenges. Are you ready to jump in and discover how these challenges aren't actually in the way, but are the way to finding harmony? Let's invite the magic back in. Hi, I'm Harmony Slater, and you're listening to the Finding Harmony podcast. Today, we are heading to connect with Ross Stomburg, who's practicing with Saraswati Joyce. And that's exactly what we are going to talk about today. His journey, what brought him to the practice, he's been traveling all over the world teaching, but also his choice to practice with Saraswati Joyce over following maybe a more conventional path of practicing with Sharat Joyce. And it's a really inspiring and interesting conversation, especially when we look at the importance of women in leadership roles and maybe some biases within our community, but how also it's very important to find a teacher that you really resonate with, someone that you feel you can learn from, that you respect, that you want to become like. And so we're exploring all of these ideas about the student choosing the teacher, and why Ross chose the teacher that he has chosen. So if you're an Ashtanga nerd and you love getting into the details of Mysore, you will absolutely love this episode. One other really amazing thing I want to tell you about is today is the first day of the Dream Business Boot Camp with Marie Forleo. If you have a dream in your heart, a business that you want to create, or if you're just feeling called, like, I just want to taste this. I want to see what it's like. What is this B school thing like? What is this dream business boot camp like? What are the steps that are being talked about how to create a strong foundation that you can grow and expand from and build upon? Then be sure you jump into this three-day boot camp. You can still catch the first day. Tomorrow will be the second day and then there'll be the third day and it's all for free. And it's going to help you really figure out where you are now, where you want to go. What's your big vision? What's your big dream? If you could have anything, absolutely anything in the world and create anything, what would that be? And then connecting also to that deeper why. Why is it so important to you? Because if you don't have your why, you won't make it happen. How will it uh, change your life? How will it change the lives of other people and people around you? So having a mission and connecting to the mission, but also connecting to your dedication, to your commitment, to your vision, um, as well as some steps to simplify the process and the support that you need to help you get there. It's, it's an amazing boot camp. It's really, really good. And you're going to just get crystal clear on the results that you want to see this year. And it's all for free. So jump in. You can find the link in the show notes or on my Instagram profile. I'm so excited about this free Dream Business Boot Camp, as well as the B-School offer that is coming up and my mastermind group helping you build the business that you love. So stay tuned. We are going all out this year to make your dreams a reality. And I hope you choose to do that with me. Hi, welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. I'm your host, Harmony, and I'm here with co-host Russell Kay. Thank you for waking me up for this, Harmony. <laughs> You're this welcome. This is very nice to be awake this early. I didn't want you to miss it because <laughs> we are here with our guest today, Ross Stamble. Hi, Ross. How are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you? <laughs> You're coming in from the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> You're in Charlottesville, but there's like there's no hint of Southern about you. No, no, no. I'm I'm Ohio born and bred. Um, so I'm I drove south here to uh, participate in uh, a beautiful shala here, Shanghai Yoga, Charlottesville, uh, where I'm gonna I'm guest teaching for um, just over a month uh, with oh. some of my, my best friends here. And they run this beautiful 
Heine Shala, and uh, they do a fantastic job here. Amazing. And that's, are those all friends of, of John? Is that who that no, is? No, I yes. think there's a lot. Uh-huh. Yeah. They're friends of John. Yeah. Friends of John. Yeah, yeah. 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 Friends of John. <laughs> right. John practiced here as well. Yeah. Okay. okay Before good. he moved to, where is he now? Is he the University in New the York. University. John, New York, right? Really? John Boltman moved to New York? Oh, John Boltman. No. No, I'm thinking of oh, the other John. You're thinking of John the other Boltman. John. Yeah, here. John yeah. Campbell. John Campbell and John, John Campbell. I have to apologize for yeah. doing that. I, the, John, your name, your last name complete. If you're listening, your last name completely escaped my mind as it came out of my mouth. Which one, like, Campbell or Boltman? Both of them. I couldn't pick up either one of your last names. Both um, of them tied to Virginia, Charlottesville. Charlottesville. <laughs> oh, John. You know, John. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's so, so nice. John is John Boltman's there. And do you university. see, do you rub elbows with him ever? Uh, unfortunately, I, I haven't. He's at the university uh, and uh, I haven't caught him yet. Uh, I, I I met him a couple of years ago when Saraswati Joyce was here in town. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we just over, we overlapped just a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. He used to uh, skateboard in my hometown in Slidell, Louisiana. He would come over from <laughs> Mississippi and he would go into the empty pools because I, I lived in a kind of uh, ghetto and there'd be all these empty pools. He just like, he just like skateboarded them. Uh, but, but also my family <laughs> is from Detroit and I can speak in a completely different way. Oh, okay. Detroit, <laughs> Detroit's just a couple hours away from, from Dayton. So Dayton, Ohio, where I'm from is little D. So Detroit's big D and, and Dayton, Ohio is little D, the little Detroit, that's because of all that's also, because of all the auto uh, parts. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, that's also how my that's father it. referred to me as little D, and he was the <laughs> big D. Um, <laughs> do you still have like long, long, like like deeply ingrained feelings of resentment towards Michigan? Is that a thing? Were, did you watch the big game this year? Actually, yeah, yeah, like Ohio State versus Michigan. Yeah. Uh, right, so we yeah. are mortal enemies, regardless of. Of my my thoughts about you, uh, yeah, we will we will never be able to be, be friends. <laughs> no, you and I aren't going to be bad. friends. <laughs> no, too bad. I no. mean, what are we missing out on? Is my question. <laughs> We're oh. going to find out today's episode. Actually, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, did were your parents in the auto industry in Dayton? My my dad's a mechanic no, no. out of Mich- out of Detroit. Oh, okay. so every. So is my uncle. Yeah. Okay. No, my family. We are all public school teachers. Oh, every one of us grew up in it. So it's we, in your blood. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So when That's we so get together at a family reunion, it is disaster. And when I say all of us, I mean all of us. Really? There's, like there's even like beyond your parents? Wow. Oh yeah, yeah. My sister, my my all my my cousins, uh, their oh, their principals or their. How can you communicate when you're all just sitting there doing your marking <laughs> on your t- on the, your students' tests? Like you can't have you yeah. can't really you can't really no. just, interact. We just didn't complain. Yeah, we just yeah, right. yeah. It's like a staff meeting. <laughs> like a staff. Yeah, everyone's smoking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's what amazing. Did, what did your parents teach? Were they, well, they were public school teachers. What what grades? Oh yeah, my mother taught uh, English, so uh, you know Hamlet, Bass, uh, you know uh, yeah. the Outsiders. You know she would she would run she would do the English program, and uh, my father would be the uh, history the history teacher. We taught and history, what, social studies, something like that. What was she in middle school, and your dad was high school? Or uh, let's see. My mother, I thought she taught, and she taught uh, like high, school. high school. Yeah, oh, yeah, high school. The outsiders sounded like middle school to me, so I guess. No, high school. Yeah. Okay. So she she could be somewhere in between all all of those grades, right? And then what did you teach? What was your specialty? They, they just programmed uh, I taught, you in just teaching. <laughs> they did. I taught visual arts for twenty three years. No so shit. We taught. Yeah. So uh, I taught painting, sculpting. Paper mache anywhere from kindergarten to uh, twelfth grade. 
Wow. Wow. Oh, that's, that's so awesome. Fun. That's like, that's the, that person is often the most significant person in a, in a young person's life, that visual arts teacher. Wow. Oh. And, and how did you transition from, from being like what you should have been an English teacher to being an <laughs> artist? Like you were an artist first, you went to school. Did you go to Ohio State? Like, how did you, how did you get into visual oh, art? Yeah. Like, was it just something you were always doing? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it was my favorite subject in high school. And then I got into college and I took my first two years as a fine arts major and I focused on classical painting. Uh, but then when I got into a room full of, like, I really liked painting, but then I got into a room full of people that were not only very skilled, but they also very much liked painting. <laughs> Though I quickly found out that I was just mediocre on my best days compared to these guys uh, so i had to i had to make a s switch i go well, what the hell what the hell can i do with two years worth of visual you know right. uh, fine arts uh classes so i uh i switched over to education which you know i was apple didn't fall fall, fall far from the tree yeah there. so uh so that it seems just like a painful kind of a choice they're all, there's no, there's no unpainful choice. <laughs> you know, painful. I love that. Yeah, that's right. I'm in agreement. <laughs> that's, that's a profound statement. There's no yeah. unpainful choice. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because it's it, these sort of cho choices, these sort of feelings, it's the feelings that kind of inform us. Like, because I, I would go into an art room and I would kind of always feel like I was the best one there. But that was that was my own just my own feeling my own uh self regard which might have been a completely wrong but i could you know if if i if i had felt differently then maybe i'd have given up sooner there's still time <laughs> there's still <laughs> time to give up that's what harmony tells me almost every day he's like russell there's still time to give up well, you seem to use it for like mental health purposes i so. do <laughs> which Did is do, that's really it's really critical though like if a day goes by i start to really feel like i'm not a very valuable person it was that a is that part of your experience now like do you feel like man i have to use my hands i have to kind of to scrawl at paper with you know with paint and color do you feel like that's that's a that's in you like it has to you have to do that uh no no, I, I, I quickly learned as, as a school teacher, I quickly learned that your personal skill, uh, doesn't mean anything, uh, unless you give it, have an opportunity to give it to someone else or, or give someone the tips. So I, I, I always say that my first day of being a school teacher was my last day of, of showing personal expression through visual art. Um, because it just sucks that energy out. You know, you just wow. have, to, you have to give that, give that energy to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was no less, nothing left to the tank at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Do you feel the same way about yoga? How does that translate? Because now you teach yoga. <laughs> yeah. Do you have no, nothing left I, in the I, tank I, afterward? Uh, you know, I, I, I was told once a long time ago that if you don't leave teaching exhausted, you didn't do it well enough. Um, I, I now That's disagree with that statement. Yeah, yeah. But, I, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna agree with that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but, oh, but no, it is exhausting. Yoga's one of those strange things. Yeah, yoga is one of those strange things where I want to keep on teaching. Uh, yeah. They mm -hmm. they almost have to kick me out of the room. Yeah. I, and, uh, oh, I and I feel like feeling. when you know when when I do get exhausted through the physical asana practice now. Um, but as far as teaching or being able to hold space or being able to give tips or advice, uh, yeah, I really cherish those times, especially when, when they have questions. Now you, you, yeah. sit, you kind of stand there and go, okay, I hope, what can I, what can I present to you? What can I offer? And when they, yeah. And when they have a question, you know, you jump at the chance. One thing that I always find, like still to this day, and and it's interesting that when you were teaching art in school, it didn't like it, you kind of felt like you didn't have any energy or like inspiration left after teaching. 
to, you know, paint or to do your your craft. But I always find like part of teaching, I always find quite inspiring. Like actually, I think it's easier to keep up with a practice and to stay motivated in your practice when you are teaching regularly then mm. like i mean now i don't teach in person regularly and i have to like find that motivation in myself but there's something that's like a little bit inspiring watching your students like yeah. gain all these benefits and so it always it was very motivating for me to to get on the mat cuz it felt like oh i want i want to experience all of that juicy goodness too but i also like i want to like make sure i do something before i get in the room it's yeah. just to get myself well, I used right. to even do mine after. But yeah, before, after, like... But you want to feel like it's you've, interesting. you're part of it. What's yeah. your experience with that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been... I Well, I always try to practice before. Yeah. Uh, one, because the rest of the day gets kind of nibbled yeah. away. You go. And I'm always... I'm I'm always inspired by the people that are in front of me. Any Anywhere. Anywhere I practice, you know, Ashtanga yogis. Ashtangis. Uh, yeah. are so driven you know every one of them are so driven and in my one of my first experiences uh in india i was sitting with dr jaya shri and president mm -hmm. Sima there and we're all you know that little room at lush and i'm all sitting there and there's like five six seven of us and i look around the room and i there's there's two doctors there's a polyglot who speaks over five languages oh there God. is a uh, a, a, uh, a international mattress sales person, you know, someone who, who oh, sells <laughs> millions of dollars of mattresses, you know? Yeah. And, I, that, and here I am. Is that the, my pillow guy, that guy? He <laughs> was no, <laughs> he should have been there. And I sit around there and I go, wow, these people are amazing. How did I, how did I end up getting in this group? But yeah. you know, I'd, I'd always rather I'd rather be the, the dumbest person in a in the in the room uh, than the smartest, you know. Uh, and, and and I find that in Ishala, I get the opportunity to to teach, and uh, I I just am just enamored by these people. So in Charlottesville, where I'm at, it's right by the university. So there are let's see, this morning there was three Ph three four PhDs. One doctor, um, a, a poet, like, uh, you know, these people that, that just out, far outweigh, you know, talking about yeah. physical gymnastics, uh, they have this mental gymnastics uh, yeah. that, that are just um, amazing. And I love seeing how they, how they use that to their advantage. Uh, they're, they're very meticulous with their practice, very understanding of their practice, mm -hmm. having, they have this great ability to not get hung up on, um, um, on the fundamentals, you know, uh, the fundamentalist attitude of mm -hmm. it and see, and, and they see way past that. Uh, and it's just, it's just great. You know, yeah. it's energetic. That must be something that you get with the Saraswati group, I think. Well, I don't think these people are necessarily the Saraswati group though, are they? They're like the Virginia uh, they're, group. They're they're the Virginia group, but uh, <laughs> they're under the guidage uh, uh, of uh, of those who Saraswati? studied with yeah. Saraswati. Okay, and it's kind of a great way to kind of segue into yeah. the topic of Saraswati Joyce, because uh, that's who you and, started uh, with, right? When you the first time I, you went to Mysore, that's who I started with. Being a school teacher yeah. in the, the summers off, June, July, and August off, right? Uh, so the opportunities to, to practice uh, in Mysore under the guidance of a Joyce family member was limited. Uh, so I was I was kind of like bummed out. I'm like, oh, when will I ever get a chance to practice? Uh, until I found out that Saraswati taught in the summer. So yeah, I didn't didn't hesitate at all to get over there and practice. Can I just back you up just a little bit? So you're, you're, you're teaching school in Ohio, in, in Dayton? Dayton, Ohio. Yeah. Dayton, Ohio. And you have an opportunity to do Ashtanga yoga and somehow. Is that right? Right. Right. And what was your, what was your draw to do that? Like you had a, a feeling that you'd like to do that. What, where did that come from? Just being an art teacher maybe? Okay. Yeah. 
Well, I, I, I grew up doing sports um, and I was looking for something. That, so I graduated in 90, 1999, you know, when right, bef- right when the internet worked, right? And uh, right when, you know, if you remember flip phones. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So uh, I was walking down the street, Cincinnati, Ohio. This was like June 23rd, 24th, something like that. Uh, and, and I saw Richard Freeman's video, v- this on VHS. Yeah. And he does the, he does this beautiful handstand, legs are in Lotus and he comes up and then, you know, he jumps back and I said, well, I, you know, I'm a collegiate swimmer. This, this isn't hard at all. Uh, and then I, I, I bought the VHS tape. I took it home and I played it primary series. Um, this was Richard Freeman doing primary series for an almost an hour and 45 minutes, you know, yeah. very slow, very ridiculous. Uh, and it kicked my ass. Uh, and, but I played that, that VHS tape until it broke. Uh, I've, and it only took me 11 years to be able to do a handstand like, you know, I still can't to do break it. Like the ta- I, to break the VHS No, I saw tape. a picture of you today that looked very close, yeah. honestly. Very close. It was, uh, it was on a podcast with Taylor Hunt. And it was okay. like, oh, that is a beautiful picture of you in a handstand in Lotus. That was nice. Oh, yeah. A long time ago. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think these shoulders can do that anymore. <laughs> so you, you play uh, that video. And you get obsessed. Uh-huh. And yeah, are you doing like it before any, you like go to school would. in the morning? Or like when are you, you're like, you're just doing this uh, every day? I would, yeah, I started doing just playing along with the video. And I would do it at when I came home because I'd be yeah. exhausted from work. I'd be, yeah. you know, my energy yeah. level would be way up here dealing with it, with the dramas and, uh, yeah. of middle school. And I needed something to unwind with and uh, get refocused and, and kind of uh, take back my energy, you know, because mm-hmm. I had to give it. I had to give it all yeah. day. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I did that for years until even found out we had a, a cult. Oh, I mean, not cult. I mean, a gathering of people who did this practice too. This was years. Uh, I found out it was in Columbus, Ohio, uh, where they said, they said, we have this person coming. His name is, is Tim Miller. And I said, who, who, who is Tim Miller? Uh, little did I know of Tim G and, and his, yeah. his just beautiful teaching and. Again, only thing I knew was the order in which in which the primary series uh, was taught through a written agreement. So he, he comes in and he sits down. He immediately does Hanumanasana or the splits are like cold, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and the entire room kind of like shushes. Jesus, who what is this man? Right? And on. then he starts he starts to talk about yamas and niyamas and and all of this and and. Yeah. Then it, it, I'm like, wow, this is, what is this? You know, he started to go into philosophy. You know how much he talks about yeah. astrology and, and stuff. Uh, mm. So he kind of opened my eyes to uh, what, you know, what Ashanga and the, and the group, uh, yeah. the collective is all about. And that must have been um, your first introduction to pranayama as well with him. Because I know he always likes to do he, a pranayama yeah, session as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. He, he said, exhale, hold. And I think that's all, all he said for like a half hour. A half hour is about right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you woke up, you lost consciousness and wake up. It was like, uh-huh. they're all still doing yeah. it. Yeah. He prefaces it yeah. with like, we're just going to do the easy work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, yeah. And then I don't know, 10 years go by and. Uh, you you're know, still I, doing I, pranayama. Oh, you're still <laughs> holding the exhale. <laughs> still holding the still holding the breath. Did uh, you like? Did you start going to Columbus and like checking in with this group, or this collective, this culture collective. of yeah, Ashtanga the cult- yogis? There, or? It, it was. Um, but that yeah, we're, I did. It's an hour and a half away, so I had uh, you know when I when I had the opportunity to go, uh, I would go, but I would always. Di- kind of self practice was was something that I was that I, I felt it was important to do. Uh and I, I did that because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. 
Right. Really. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know how easy it was when you have a teacher in front of you and, and people next to you being motivated, and then you can go out and get coffee, and then you know, upset about forward folds. <laughs> can I? I just want to ask you a personal question. You can. You don't have to answer this, and we can cut this whole thing out. But my my experience of of working with school teachers, I was the. Uh, Joyce Foundation for about 10 years, training school teachers and kids, um, you know, how to self-regulate. And, you know, we were using some the techniques of yoga to do so. And I spent a lot of time with superintendents and teachers and heads of department and um, really kind of immersed myself in school culture for a good long time. Spent, you know, two years embedded in, in the Milwaukee public school system, just there, living there. Um, for example, in the same way with the uh, Ravenswood City School District in California. Um, my experience was that a lot of teachers, and I really admired what you said about the, your need to, to fill up your own well after teaching. Because my, my experience was that so many school teachers, and it's rife in the culture, spend everything they have. And then they just go insane on the weekend with um, substance abuse and and um, uh, what's the opposite of womanizing when you <laughs> manonizing and and like there's a real there's a real like um, a, a Not need sure we have a word for that there's a need we should have a word for that <laughs> there's a real need to like just to get away from like I had one school, oh no, I shouldn't tell no. that joke. Yeah, 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 that's a terrible joke. <laughs> but um, it's just like that. That's really rife in the culture to to really kind of uh, abuse yourself on the on the weekend in some way. And I and I and I just was very much admiring that you kind of saw what was happening to you. And of course, you come out of a teaching culture, and you said, "Well, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to refill my well with a kind of spiritual, you know, as a physical practice." I wonder, um. Was well, one was was a uh, conscious choice. Was substance was abuse a, a a part of a cycle that you were dealing with, or was you just like you saw it? Did I need to fix this right away? Uh, no, no. I actually, I I never really drank or smoked. I experimented in in junior high and high school like anybody, but it, mm -hmm. it didn't take me very long to figure out that I I really didn't want anything to do with that. Uh, I just. I wanted time to myself and I wanted um, time to process mm -hmm. everything at, at work. Um, you know, uh, educators uh, are, as we all know, underpaid, undervalued, um, mm -hmm. and they are, they are like the foot soldiers uh, of education where mm -hmm. other people implement and plan and, and, uh, and pontificate what education is. Teachers are the ones that are actually doing it, mm -hmm. um, and they get the uh, they. So they get uh, so the administration will get the accolades if teachers are successful, uh, and teachers will get the blame when mm -hmm. it's not successful. Right. Um, uh, but uh, it's a it's a rewarding job uh, if. If you have the energy for it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you were so you were fairly clean when you came to Ashtanga Yoga, which is cool and unusual, and <laughs> and it sounds sounds like you were also like pretty well adjusted, also unusual, and but you still had this kind of need to to do it, and. Well, I think he, as he talked about the stress, like there's yeah. a lot of stress and, and it seemed like it attracted you as a, as a way to balance your nervous system basically after well, teaching. Yeah. But I'll, I'll preference that's a why I did it. I'll, I'll tell you my day. Um, so I'd ride my bike to work. Uh, but I wouldn't turn left to ride eight miles to work. I would, I would turn right to ride 25 miles to work. Oh my God. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I would come home I, at work. I'd come home practice, and then at practice. After that, I would then divide my time into practicing judo or rock climbing or rowing. So, yeah. 
Um, and you, you swim too. To. You are like a, a champion swimmer uh, as well, right? Okay. I, w- I wouldn't say champion, but I, I was <laughs> swimmer. Uh, so uh, I, I certainly was was over using um, right. sport uh, to fill up some time. So so that stress that stress stayed with me. I just had to get get it out uh, in a different right. way. And it caught up with me too. So. Yeah, that's interesting though. Um, I'd love to, this is like another diversion. We're going to get back to Saraswati. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm curious, like, because Hello, Bill. a lot of people say, and and I agree to a certain extent, you know, that like, I mean, yoga, the physical asana is like nervous system, you know, it's regulating your nervous system and it's it's a very physical practice, especially the Ashtanga yoga practice um and that you know there's other ways that you can also that help to regulate your nervous system like running or like biking or swimming or doing these these activities and i think that it's true in that there's um you know i think you're getting rid of that that sort of stress response Mm -hmm. when you do those other activities but what was it? I mean, there must have been something very different about the quality right. of the practice that kept drawing you back to it, that you were getting something different from that than from these other physical activities. Um, that's a good question. Yes, I was. And the one element that, that, uh, that, in the dialogue that I would have, the one element was the philosophy behind mm-hmm. it. So the uh-huh. so when I would study judo, I, you know, I, I traveled in London, traveled to Japan to practice. Amazing. Uh, and they and they had they had some underlying um, protocols that that are in, exactly yes. in line with with mm-hmm. asana practice, under practice. You know, it's that slow, lifelong uh, approach to it. Uh, it's the, um, you know, it's the, the guru shinsha, the, the teacher student relationship, mm-hmm. uh, that, that is supposed to maintain, be maintained. Uh, there's a respect towards, uh, your fellow students. And it, there is this understanding that there is a deeper meaning behind the techniques. Mm-hmm. You know, that it doesn't, it's not a technique to use superficially. It's a technique that will be working on you internally, uh, occupying your time, uh, in the right way, you know, mm-hmm. occupying, recognizing in, your, in yourself that, uh, knowing something and knowing it really, really well, uh, mm-hmm. is valuable. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so I took that into yoga. So when I, when I started yoga, um, I, I was, I was coachable, you know, you, you gave, give me a hammer and, and you tell me if you're my teacher, hit yourself in the head with the hammer. I, okay. How, how many times, you know, cause I, I, I could do it. And I remember my very first day, right in the shala, um, you know, I, we did, um, lead primary, you know, uh, Sarah Swati came in, uh, a come inhale. And I thought to myself, I, I don't want to. Why am I even here? I know this. Like, I, I know I can do primary series. Yeah. Uh, and then I thought to myself, you know, it's not a good attitude. You know, I, I'm, I'm here for other reasons. And I, um, and I say, I, I want to be here. You know, I, w- yeah. I want to be here. I, I don't want to be the, uh, I don't want to be, uh, the, the student that just tries. I want to be, I want to be in this room for a reason. Uh, and I want to take this lifestyle with me. So it kind of cemented in me that uh, an athletic lifestyle, uh, as Spartan as it can it can be financially, emotionally, um, that it's a it's a lifestyle worth pursuing. It has value. Yeah, that's so amazing. I I really I really admire you. I I feel like there's so much of the right attitude keeps percolating. Uh, as, as I watch your approach to, to life and to practice, cause like I, I came to my sort of very, with a very corrosive attitude, uh, or which was just to get people to look at me. 
And it was not helpful. And it, it created long-term destructive patterns that I'm still kind of now recovering from. Well, it's interesting because maybe a lot of people come to Mysore with that. Well, he's he's impression. sounding really good to me. Yeah, well, mm. that was in his that was in his mm. he has a master's well, in education, so he coached himself into a beginner's very coachable mindset. Coachable person. <laughs> I'm like, man. Said, "What can I learn from this? I'm here to I, learn." <laughs> I wish I had his parents. Is what I'm thinking. Well, <laughs> you know, and and we we talk about let's let's put the focus a little bit on on Sarah's body and her students and her shala yeah. and, and who. Uh, you know, is are drawn, yeah, to yeah. Saraswati, and um, I I practiced my first season, my second season there. Uh, the, the woman to my left uh, had breast cancer. Oh, wow. uh, she quit her job. Her and her husband moved, uh, sold everything, quit her job. She was gonna die. You know the whole, and then she came oh. in, um, and the person to my right, uh, I won't share his name. Uh, came from New York. His um, wife and daughter were killed in a car accident, and he came. Wow. And here I am uh, saying, oh, I, I've come for a spiritual awakening. And to my left and to my right, they're here for healing. And they were using this modality to heal some of the most heinous, some of the most difficult uh life experiences and they had mm-hmm. such faith and such love and 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 such uh, uh you know they had to put themselves in this situation uh and they that was that was deep that was i'm like okay i need to change my attitude about mm-hmm. about this practice right yeah yeah, yeah, that's so interesting and and beautiful, a beautiful example, right? One is sort of like, what can I get from this? Yeah, and it's very self centered approach, and one is a little bit more like, I really need this to heal, but also, it just feels a little bit more universal than just like, I don't know. I think we can get a little myopic in our our spiritual practice and our spiritual endeavors that. In some ways, instead of opening us up to love and inclusivity and healing and, um, you know, not discriminating against people, <laughs> you know, we can get really closed minded about people in life. And, you know, if you're not doing this, then you're not evolved. And we start creating all these dichotomies because we're, we've put ourselves on this path, this spiritual ladder where we're trying to reach the t- top. Right. And so, of course, we have to um, put a bunch of people below us. <laughs> and so, oh, of course. Right. I mean, that's what happens when you're on this ladder to the top and you're trying to like reach some goal of enlightenment or whatever it is you're trying to reach. Um, I'm more enlightened than this person. Right. Oh, that person's more enlightened than me. So I better work harder. Or I better do more. Or I better relax you know. harder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. drink only water. And <laughs> I don't know. Like, at some point, you no, stop. No sugar. You know, yeah, no, no sugar. sugar in the chai. <laughs> right. Whoops. So <laughs> then, but then, if you're doing it for healing purposes, it's very different because it's more about. It's not about getting anywhere. It's really about integrating and allowing and loving and being present and all of those things: forgiving, releasing, letting go. And so it becomes a little bit different. It's not so hierarchical. All of a sudden, it becomes a little bit more like universal and and sweet. And if I had yeah, had that yeah. attitude, I really could have competed better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we have this lower level self love, yeah. right? And as we kind of go up the, the chakras, we have uh, we have selfless love, yeah. uh, which is uh, is giving without receiving. Yeah, um, yeah, and it, it's hard to stay up in that. Of the selfless love, because uh, it's yeah, you always want to be, uh, uh, you know, recognized. Mm-hmm. So it's hard yeah. to, to do that. Yeah, it's uh, it is. It's interesting. I've I I mean, as a school teacher, I think you'd appreciate this. You know, like really looking and defining your values. You know, whether like as a human being, as a person, but also, I mean, as even a yoga teacher. 
you know, what are your your values and really like taking time to to look and examine and explore those. And I've been kind of doing this this exploration over a few years, you know, because at first you're like, well, I value everything, <laughs> right? Like, and uh, yeah, and of course we do, right? But there's some things that are that are core for us. And like, it takes some time to really recognize what is core sometimes. What are those core values? And um, and I think it's really important because then you can always kind of check yourself too, right? And so, you know, selfless service, it doesn't have to be a core value <laughs> for anyone. But if it is, and it's sort of one of my recognized values, right? Like, how can I be of service here without needing recognition or without needing you know, status or compensation, <laughs> even though, of course, we all need compensation in some way, right? It's not about, like, you know, just not valuing your services either, but also, like, you know, offering from that generous open heart rather than going into a situation thinking, like, how can I benefit from this, right? And and I think then you can always kind of check yourself if you've defined that as a value, right? Exactly. Same like with courage or authenticity or love, right? Or unconditional love or justice or whatever it is that, that you know, you value as a teacher or a human. I think it's so important to really connect to those and so that you can live them because it does get hard sometimes, as you're saying, you know, as a yoga teacher, you know, devoted to the practice and devoted to teaching, it's not the easiest path. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for, to that point, how do you make a um, a decision to leave teaching in, in the public school and say, I'm going to uh, grow out my hair and put on a Shtanga yoga sweater and then be a professional <laughs> Shtanga yoga teacher? I mean, at some point, don't you think about the pension that you're going to miss out on? Like there's a, that's, that's a big decision. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, so I, I've like I like I mentioned, I I put twenty three years in. Uh, I only had about six years to go. Uh, and it, it, <laughs> that's my so reaction. <laughs> it's like oh no, no, my <laughs> mine too, mine too. Uh, but I, I, it was uh, just the environment in which I, I continued to put myself in. Um, mm-hmm. Won't go into details, but. When we, when you get to the part in your job where you're wiping your own blood off the wall, um, you kind of step back and go, Gosh. I'm not in, I'm not in the environment I thought mm-hmm. I would be in. Uh, mm-hmm. so it, it, it got to the point where I said, you know, maybe, maybe teaching yoga may, may be a little easier. Yeah. Safer. Uh, and say, uh, certainly a little, a little safer. Uh, and it was a gradual. A, a gradual change. So, uh, I was teaching school and then I would teach on the weekends, uh, which was great. I loved it. It, it got me a, a chance to leave Ohio for a little while. Uh, and then when I would do some international travel, I would leave right after work on Friday. I get right at home on my oh say Sunday, get the red eye Sunday, two o'clock in the morning or Monday, two o'clock in the morning. I, I, you know, run home run back to work. Uh, and then, uh, eventually I would, you know, over the holidays where I would have a little bit longer break, I'd take mm-hmm. a little longer trip. Uh, and just, just a few incidences where, where I thought maybe, maybe teaching doesn't need to be my, my full-time profession. Um, so technically I'm not retired. Say I have a year of absence. So that, what that means is my job is on hold. And if I want to, to return and pursue it, um, uh, by August, 2024, uh, then I, I have that opportunity. But uh, as of right now, I'm, I'm really hoping I don't need to rely on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They may have to. Yeah, maybe in a new school district. <laughs> hey, you could look in the future know. and see that the, like, the state of Ohio renegotiated labor contracts and you wouldn't even get a pension in the first place. Then Probably. you would be able to make some those you know those choices. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. So also, 
you're in India because you also practice with Sharat Joyce, right? So you kept going back to Mysore and you practice with Sharat Joyce? No. No, no, I haven't practiced with okay. Shira. No, okay. um, I, I've just had my summers available. Okay. So okay. I would continue, I'd go back and continue to practice with yeah. uh, Saraswati. And then with Saraswati's group, uh, I ended up practicing with uh, David Roach, okay. uh, yeah, a, yeah. A, a mentor and a, and a great, I, I feel yeah. like just a great um, person to be with. And, uh, and then that kind of, gra- I, I kind of went with, you, you kind of have a choice, you know, we're starting to see these generations of teachers yeah. uh, and uh, kind of which, which way you want to go, like old school, mm-hmm. new school, and where and I feel new, new Swati, the new, new school, the neo school, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, you have the, you have Saraswati who I feel has, the, has this vast knowledge of, of what it used to be yeah. um, before the logistics of running a room of 500 people became uh, so, you know, the, the view has been, I think, the perspective has, has changed. Um, and, uh, and then, so with her, I find, took me first, took me a while to figure out her understanding of time. Mm. When, she, when she would say something like, oh, try, try tomorrow, she didn't really mean try tomorrow. She meant try in like two years. <laughs> and, and when you would try to pin her down with a question, uh, tomorrow, next week, you know, what, when can I do this? You know, it, her mind never worked that way. You know? <laughs> so she doesn't have like the linear uh, Western mind. And I also <laughs> noticed I started watching her mannerisms. And when she would get these rapid fire questions, uh, the typical rapid fire questions you'd get from, from a new Ashanga student. How long do I have to practice in order to do second series? How long do I have to practice to get authorized? How, you know, you know, these, these little yeah. questions. Her English got really bad, right? During that time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but it mir- so miraculously it got much better at the end. Why, you know, when everyone was, was saying goodbye. Uh, and, uh, and I, so I, I, you know, when I, when I'm in with other, uh, students, uh, I, I, I watch her, I get the opportunity to watch her and, mm-hmm. and she's very somewhat reserved. She's a little older now, uh, mm-hmm. and she's very quiet. Uh, but some of the older students that would practice with her under Guruji would say that she presented herself very much like Guruji. Yeah, I in, in her, yeah, mannerisms. Uh, just in her stature and her mannerisms. Yeah. And any time that we would, any time that she would have a conference, any reference of any technique, she would always refer to Guruji. Always, mm-hmm. this is how Guruji did it. So this is how I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I and I noticed like any time she had, she kind of has her own criteria for. um expressing to to her students um if, if they're kind of ready to to teach or if they've kind of taken on a, a stature beyond that of a total uh beginner uh which i which i admire uh which is first she she wants to hear you chant yeah. which is strange at the end so we'll we would chant we you pull out these chant sheets yeah. uh and uh, she would she would chant and she would like kind of watch us, you know, and listen to us chant. So she always wanted us to know, wanted to press that you know, yeah. chant. What are you doing by besides just the just the asana? Yeah, yeah you could see her in her eyes. She's just like uh, yeah, whatever. You know, I I seen first second series. I've seen third. You know, I've seen fourth series. I've seen it all. Mm. It, the the that doesn't impress press her. Uh, yeah. At the, at the least that great story. So we're in this room of like, uh, 90 people. This is a couple of years ago. And we had someone come in, uh, and, uh, I, I'm not going to share her name, but it's kind of funny. Uh, she kind of trying to catch up and she had the audacity to say, uh, sir, so you wait, I'm almost right. You know, I'm almost catching up. Uh, and they're trying to kind of look, looks at her like, you, are you, you just interrupt me? And she's, 
and, and she and she says, I, but I, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. I can do this. And she kind of gestures to the audience. She says, everyone here is a teacher. <laughs> yeah, that's and yeah. yeah. So she kind of put everyone in their in their place. Yeah. Um. Well, uh, we kind of rambled. I'm sorry. No, no that's right. beautiful. What were we talking I wanted, about? I wanted to <laughs> um to make a commentary on your exposition. Um, I remember one of the things that I had, I felt about Saraswati is that I immediately was aware on my first trip to Mysore when she first started teaching in the Big Shala in 2003, the first month, I was that there was, I felt uh, an underlying, um, an underlying uh, misogyny. I don't know if that's the right word, but... Um, Tension. This, Tension? Right? What is it like when against you, women? Yeah, against women. What do you call that when you're um, when you're hateful towards groups? I think that's misogyny. No, not not any group. Mm -hmm. oh. Discrimination. Discrimination. There was an underlying <laughs> discrimination against a female teacher in the room, and I just kind of felt it. People would always say, "Oh, I don't want Saraswati to adjust me," or "Oh, you know, it's Saraswati. It's not Sharad. It's like, oh, you know, Saraswati, give me a posture, and you know." And I would I would listen to it. And I just kept hearing it and hearing it. And I'm like, you know, she's really good. I would say to myself, like I, what she did to me and what she adjusted to me and what she said, I would keep feeling it in myself without judging it. Yeah. And like, prejudicial. There was something prejudicial. prejudicial about a female teacher. And it's like she's I don't see what they're seeing. So I arrived. And Sharat was on a month long tour of the United States in 2003 in April. I saw him on his first day in New York and Eddie Stern introduced him. And then I, I went to Mysore and Saraswati greeted me at the front door and uh, got me into her apartment and said, yeah, I have a place you can rent for me. And I was up on the upstairs of her building across the street. And then every morning I'd go down to practice and I would do my practice and come back and she'd be teaching her woman's group on the second floor. And she had a group of Indian women that she was teaching. And now for the first time, she was helping Guruji in the shala in the morning before, before that group. And I was just doing my practice, keeping my head down, you know, being quiet. And she just really liked me. I don't know. She, we just really got along. I, I always talked to her after practice and ask her how things were going. And she just really liked me. And she said, you need to do second, second series now. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I've been here like a week or so, but like, okay. <laughs> and so, so how much, you know, how much do I do? It's like, what do you, you do, um, uh, Pashasana, Kranchasana. And I, and I was like, I was surprised. And I said, Kranchasana? And she looked at me like, <laughs> Are you arguing with me? I was like surprised to get two postures. That's all. He said, "Well, what are you doing with Guy? Guy Donahue in New York?" It's like, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm doing Carter and Devasana." Oh yeah, do that. <laughs> oh fuck. <laughs> I was like, "All right." So I show up, and now for two weeks, I'm just going. I'm showing up every morning, and I'm doing primary all the way up to Carter and Devasana. And all the other students in the room were like. Dude, you're you have no idea what you're what you've done. I don't know. Guruji's adjusting me in everything. He's coming by very happy, adjusting me to Kapitasana, adjusting me to Vipada, you know, seeing if I need help with Karnavasana. I don't, you know. And you know, and it's like it's just going on. And then I really I just really liked her and I liked her work. And then Shirat came in, saw me, and just like knocked it over like a pile of toys like, <laughs> you know like no this is not how this works I'm like okay and and then she broke her ankle and mm -hmm. i went to visit her in the hospital i'm trying to make a point out of the story but i just always really liked her and i liked my relationship with her but i was very much aware that there was a kind of conflict within the community and within the family, though 
Guruji benevolently, or maybe maybe amused, bemused, bemused, watching the whole dynamic. But he was like, Saraswati's in the room. We're going to have her in the room, no matter what anyone thinks about it. Mm-hmm. And I was, and I always just felt it was really deeply unfortunate and tragic that no one like could stand up. It's like, we're going to have Saraswati in the room. I know she's female, but I, we all really rate her. And I remember, I think just to put a bow on this story, I remember when I really, it, this is the point where I really appreciated her and what she could do. As Mark Yao was learning fifth series in the room that year. And he was getting posture by posture from Guruji. On, and he, was, he got up to this one posture where you're supposed to stand underneath your own feet and then do a TikTok back and forth and just keep putting the feet behind the hands in front of the hands, behind the hands in front of the hands. And Guruji is like hitting him, like trying to make him do it. And like just kind of grunting at him, like you do this and then you jump back and you do this and you jump back. And it's like, and Mark is like totally confused, probably as our listeners are too, as for my description of it. <laughs> and then Saraswati comes over, she said, no, you jump forward underneath your hands, you jump back and then you stand on your feet like this, like that, with this breath, inhale, exhale that breath. And I like, I did a double take because everyone here in the room is like not rating Saraswati and what she knows. And she doesn't know anything like who did she ever even practice? Like she knows the vinyasa count like that of a fifth of the, of the fifth series posture. And she knows exactly how to teach it. Who the hell is anybody here saying she doesn't know what she's doing when no one here has even never done third series? What's interesting is I think what you're bringing up is is a, a fascinating kind of, um, like you're saying, a prejudice, yeah. especially in the community, especially back then. I mean, we're talking about 20 years ago mm-hmm. um, or longer. <laughs> and, longer. And there was definitely a, um, I mean, it, it's definitely a patriarchy, 100%. And, yeah. and there's yeah. a... People look to the male as the father figure, as the authority, as the one who knows. And also there's a discrimination against body type, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Saraswati is not this like, you know, athlete, athlete, right? But she was. (laughs) Yeah, but, you know, so, so again, there's like a discrimination against that. And also, I mean, Saraswati did a lot. She had two children she took care of her father she took care of her husband. you know yeah took care of her husband you know like did a lot of things that women do that preclude them from having hours and hours of time to practice asana every day and right, there's a discrimination let's... against that as well <laughs> well let's let's give the viewers at this point if they're still with us but let let me let me kind of paint a picture for for Sarah's yeah. body and her and her backstory a little bit yeah. Uh, so, uh, Saraswati uh, Rakaswamy, last name. Uh, she uh, grew up uh, in this this strict understanding of asana. So she started teaching or learning this asana as a child, uh, and then in, when you reach the the age to have children, then you're supposed to give up the asana yeah. and do the the seventh series, right? Yeah, you're supposed to do yeah. the uh, that uh, yeah. work. So Guruji needed someone to cook for him, you know, as yeah. you know, when he traveled and, and, yeah. and Saraswati was, uh, let me back up. So Saraswati uh, was certified by her father, but by Krishmacharya. Uh, Krishmacharya. So, I mean, if you want, if you want to, to be honored through uh, Prabhupada, right, you know, yeah. how, 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 how many teachers have you had that, the, you know, who has trained with this father of modern, yeah. modern yoga? Amazing. Uh, and she's also the one of the first uh, women to go to the Sanskrit, uh, or, or Sanskrit uh, oh, college gosh. in Mysore, get a degree. Uh, and she started like her own little revolution uh, cool. in the 70s when she said she was the first teacher to have both male and female in the same room yeah. at the same time. Mm-hmm. So she, she's this little fireball. Uh, yeah, she is. In, in Mysore. 
Uh, and and so yeah, so when when Guruji passed, and when uh, kind of who who was going to be the face of Shanga Yoga, uh, I think she graciously uh, recognized uh, you know Sh- Sharat's uh, ability and attraction, mm-hmm. and uh, and and kind of gave gave that. Uh, you know, she is a, a guru to the same level as a Shira, but she doesn't advertise as much. Yeah. She, uh, she's very much still, uh, uh, keeping to the traditions, uh, of it. And, uh, you know, you, there, it doesn't take long for, for you to recognize her, her value is in that shala. Um, she will knock on wood. She, she will die in that shala because that's, that's yeah, her listen. life, you know? Uh, if you, if you get a check, go, go look at her website. It's the yeah. worst website you will ever, you'll ever see it. it you're like, is this a half, you know, it's not going to happen, but it's, it's what she cares about. Like she, mm-hmm. she cares zero, zero about, uh, you know, what it looks like, yeah. uh, zero about Instagram and TikTok, zero about, uh, rumors, zero. I mean, nothing. She's oblivious to that. Um, you see her smile. Just a little, and you can see it in her eyes. And that's when she sits down in that seat and she has a student in front of her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, and sometimes she'll, she'll kind of glance at the room, uh, and you think she doesn't pay attention, but, uh, like, so when I, I do Bujak and Dasana, I always do left leg first. I don't know why it's just what I do. Yeah. I mean, I'm in the second to last row. There's 80 people in the room. We do lead primary, uh, and, uh, and hour and a half goes by. I, you know, I say, Hey, sir, so have you been? I, I just got here, uh, off the plane and she, she'd say, Oh, le- left leg wrong. You know, <laughs> so you, you think that she, she doesn't miss a beat. Like she sees everything, mm-hmm. but she comments on so very little, uh, like another op- op- she came to K- Kentucky, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, fun. Uh, and again, a full room, 100, 120 people here. Yeah. And when there, she's here for a whole week and, and <laughs> someone, you know, put their hand up and go, Hey, Sir Swati, um, is there anything we can work on? This is the last question on the last day. She says, Oh, breast wrong. And, and they kind of said, who? And she said, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so she doesn't pull any punches. Um, yeah. and she, she <laughs> notices everything. Uh, and I think she always waits for, uh, she doesn't as- assert her, uh, her, the teaching, you know, she's waiting for a student to approach her with a question. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's because this, uh, the style that she knows it as, and she presents it as, as a family style, you know, she's, you know, we go, oh, you know, where did you where did you learn this? And she'd go living room, <laughs> you know, living room. in the living room, you know, uh, she would, you know, we would, this is like, these are the little things. So, you know, we started at like five o'clock in the morning, uh, and the sunrise would come up, you know, in the middle shala, whatever you want to call it, new old shala. <laughs> and, and as soon as the light hit the window, she would kind of stand up and turn the lights off. Yeah. And. You know, we, we, we go, why? Oh, is it the sacred light that's coming in the morning? It's like, oh, no, money. Yeah, she's saving <laughs> so, on the <laughs> Money, yeah, saving so, so she's saving. She's trying to save a, 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 a couple extra rupees. Uh, and, really. and and you get it because because she practiced and taught and grew up under, under uh, without the, the benefits of yeah. Of all the money that came in later, you know, she's yeah. still very much, uh, uh, a, a daughter of a, of a lowly professor, you know, yeah. you know she is under that, that saving that kind of way. Yeah. I appreciated that about Patabi Joyce always too, that even though, you know, later in life, he got a lot of income from teaching yoga. Uh, he never really lost that, that perspective or. Of course you would appreciate that. <laughs> This is the uh, land of Scottish people, Calgary, Alberta, and they will spend, they will drive 30 minutes to save two cents on gas. 
Wow. I mean, it drives me crazy. But there's there's something beautiful about maintaining that that groundedness and that down to earthness and that sense of of not wasting or not, you know, like using what you need. Mm. And I think there's something very yogic about it too, right? I mean, besides it can save the planet. Not driving a half hour to save two cents on gas, but you know, just yeah, like next Costco, next Costco, yeah, just gas. thinking about about our consumption, thinking about our our use of things too, right, and how we're our resources. I also, I also think uh, it's it's an interesting dynamic that's going on in the family because I think about how um, they have a, a competitive spirit between the family members between Manju and Sharat and Saraswati and, and Guruji. And, and I, I think just to, to lay it out for our listeners, it's like, it's sometimes it's, it's awkward and uncomfortable to see, you know, Sharat and his sister fighting or to see, you know, tension between them. But I, it's, there is, you know, they're not saints. They're not a family of of Ramana Maharishis. Like they they have. I've often made the mistake of thinking that they, that you know you're studying with the family where the family thinks of them thinks, that, like they have ownership over you as a student, and you can't betray them by going to another one. And I didn't appreciate that that perspective. That if I went to Saraswati, or when Saraswati asked me to sub her class when she went to Russia that I was betraying Sharat's trust. Like that never occurred to me at all. Like it blew my mind. Like I thought we were all in this together. <laughs> I was like, this is a, this is not good. I was like, I, I'm at a total loss here. And it's, but it's interesting to think about that, you know, that, you know, that culture that they have within themselves, you know, between themselves, I mean. Well, yeah, yeah, I think that is like, an Indian thing, like something yeah. that cultural, something we won't, uh, we don't, we're not privy to. Uh, and we also have to recognize that they're just people too. They've been given a responsibility that none of them really wanted mm -hmm. to be in charge of this international world renowned yoga system where they look at it, or at least Saraswati approaches it, and she's like, this is just a family yoga thing this is just what we right. did as a kid this is this mm -hmm. they never expected it to, to grow like like it has mm -hmm. uh and i and so so i know around like 2007 2008 you know when when both of them wanted to, to own or or kind of steer, steer the boat sort of say uh so Siraswati was very much into the idea of kind of deregulating this whole like authorization um cert certification kind of thing yeah. you know she wanted to like half it and and rebuild you know and kind mm -hmm. of start you know kind of freshly um and that kind of you know pulled her this way and i know Sharat was eager to to go you know and rightly he should you know out years and years and years of of, of work um and that 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 came came to a head, you know. Right. Uh yeah. very and much. So. so both of them both of them need to express this this style in their in their own way. And you know, that gets I have a lot of people ask, um, like, oh, oh, you're you know, you're you're not with Shira, why you know, what's the difference between uh yeah. Saraswati and, and you know the authorization? I said, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly have no idea. I know I know what Saraswati wants and expects, um, and uh, you know it's the same postures, the same integrity, the same practice. Uh, I, I I honestly think the only difference uh, is that Saraswati shows me some old old school first generation third series stuff, mm -hmm. like some of the other stuff's out of different in a different order than it currently yeah. is. Yeah, and it, it takes me forever to like so. You know, when you're in front of them, they tell you to do something. You do, you do it. You don't question. You just do it to the best of your ability. Yeah. Uh, so, so it takes me forever to figure out like <laughs> where she, you know, I kind of go, okay, are you talking about like, um, Karandabasana 
1982 style or 1999 <laughs> style, you know, straight banana back mm-hmm. style, which, yeah, you right. know, which style they want me to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's kind of, it, it's interesting. Uh, yeah. How do you think that like t- studying with her has affected your teaching? Um, I, I, I try to, I, I, first I try to see the person as a person who is doing some yoga. Uh, I see what they're doing right, which 89%, 92% of what they're doing is absolutely right. And Mm -hmm. if I'm in their way, if anything, I may decrease their ability to practice well. Right. <laughs> and I, I notice, I notice she looks at people, uh, and, uh, she doesn't give up on them. Uh, and she, she doesn't keep that. She doesn't keep the barrier, you know, the, the gateway postures, uh, weren't, were never a thing, you know, it was only, it was only there to learn for the logistics of the, of the huge classes. Like, oh, you can't bind, get out, get the next person in. <laughs> Where Sarah Swatty right. would be like, oh, okay, let's bind to the best of your ability. Let's move on. Yeah. And so she Bunch introduces, yeah, so she introduces postures a little bit faster because there's yeah. benefit to doing most of them well compared to meticulously mm-hmm. sticking that in to, to one person. And I think that that messes with people too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, it is a, it is we're not here to be a uh, perfection. Yeah. It's a, it's a new rule about being, it's a factor, as you said, it's a factor of, it's a way of controlling the class and a way of controlling the group. And so that you have some with this, you know, huge mass of people, you have some way of controlling what's going on. And, and yeah, Mm -hmm. and I think your point is, is right that it does, it does reinforce. I mean, I think it reinforces patterns that we already have within us as, as humans and, and our society, you know, of perfectionism or, um, like. Oh, I have to do more or work harder to be good enough. And, and it kind of reinforces those beliefs and patterns that are already in our culture, which yoga is actually supposed to be like unwinding, not tightening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's a dynamic there. It's, it's almost like the, the Confucian Taoist dynamic in Korea, mm-hmm. where you start out like you, the goal is to become Taoist and and unmediated in your appreciation of the beauty of nature and and how cosmic it is but the, when you've got you know 500 you know 6 year olds in your community you got to you kind of need to kind of control that situation right. and you start with the discipline of children in a confucian way to then allow them to get to the point where you know, they're 90 years old and they're really deeply ap- appreciating how beautiful nature is. Mm. But you, you don't start with that. Yeah. Just letting them, letting 15,000 children just run free. I don't know. It depends on your approach. <laughs> it's a lo- well, you're going to get into a Lord of the Flies situation <laughs> very quickly. Well, I, I think simply put, you know, th- these, uh, you know, you got to learn the rules before you can break the rules. Yeah. In this case, learn the rules really, really well. Know what works. And know that the rules don't know you. So you don't mm-hmm. don't need to always abide by that. You don't need to fall into that yeah. fundamental a- attitude. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I don't think they, I, I think us as, as Westerners assumed wrongly that the harder we push, the more enlightened we're going to be. It's just, yeah. it just go more is more. Right. More is more. Uh, yeah. And where I think they see it in a much longer term, you know, you, you, you use the rough part of the most undisciplined part of your life uh, to be disciplined, uh, you know, in your in your teens, in your 20s, maybe in your 30s, uh, when that would benefit you the most. And then as the I think as the optimist starts to trickle away, the, the discipline of the, 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 the physicality of it becomes uh, harder to, to reach. And that's going to be replaced with Yana, you know, with, with uh, yeah. absorbing stuff through uh, uh, philosophy and, and experience. You know, yoga is not, yoga is experience uh, and maturing through those experiences. 
uh, and we, we aren't, we aren't yogis at 20 or 30. We're just asana practitioners. Yeah. I love that yoga is experience and maturing through experience, which I think really brings home the point that, that our life and, and being present for our lives is the yoga practice. And it's not, you know, binding your hands in Marichi Asana D or being able to do a backbend. It's really about the quality of presence and attention we're bringing to each moment of our life, right? Because it is the being in the experience of life itself that really is when we're in a state of yoga, right? Mm. Yeah. 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 And it's, but it's, I love the challenge of getting into that posture. So when those people say that's an asana, well, for, for that, for those five breaths, it is about the asana. <laughs> but the other, yeah, but the other 50,000 right? breaths you do, yeah, those other breaths mm. are, are needed. For, for yeah, those are about other posture. things, right? Like washing the dishes or walking your dog or writing an email. I was going to say that earlier you were talking about sports not having the same kind, most sports not having the, the same kind of um, precepts that you find in Ashtanga yoga or, or judo. And it's absolutely true. But once learned, you can go back to other sports and bring your yamas and niyamas to, to golf or to swimming and, and use, you know, satya and, and asteya and, and De- and pr- have profound experiences there. Oh, like the dharana, right? Like yeah. that quality you of concentration. You can find absorption, you know, mm-hmm. within dog walking. Oh, uh, among other things. Like, uh, mm-hmm. so I was on a new, uh, judo, judoka, you know, judo player for eight years. Uh, and I can say I practiced the art of judo twice. I, I was able to throw someone uh, with the technique, uh, um, effortlessly twice out of eight years throwing someone takes half of a second so i could i can honestly say i probably did the true judo for about two seconds out of eight eight oh years God. the rest of the time Maybe. it was grinding you know you grind you get hurt you get injured you work out you you know you, you do all of these things but i think that experience uh you know you gotta you gotta build that up and recognize is it all worth it uh, and who knows? I, th- I think with yoga, it, it's t- is true too. Uh, most of it's in the you know you're in the dirt and you're in the mud. Uh, most of most of those times, you know, ninety nine percent of doing a lot of chitwari, uh, a lot of, yeah. of push ups. Oh yeah, a lot of push ups. <laughs> a lot of push ups. Yeah, I love that. I'm I'm. This has been so it's sweet been really and nice talking with you today and and i i didn't i didn't know you and and getting to know you has been really really nice and i'm glad to to make your acquaintance ross thank you it's it's a new team finally and can you tell everyone who's listening where they can find you and connect with you and what's coming up uh yeah you can you can find me at uh usually on instagram uh at ashtangi of ross uh, recently, I post pictures of my tiny house and a little motorcycle. Um, so if you want to know, uh, you have some you know if you have any motor, motor hands, if you have any motor hands out there, yeah, I, I, I try to stick know. with, okay. I try to stick to, to yoga. That's kind of like my thing. Uh, and, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm here in Charlottesville until January 7th. And then I go on like a little mini world tour. Yeah, uh, oh, Kazakhstan and India, and hopefully, let's see, Germany, Mexico, Brazil, um, uh, Ghana, um, maybe, maybe, um, maybe uh, Saigon, um, and uh, maybe Spain. So it's all so you know how yoga teaching works. You kind of string these, yeah, you piece these it things together, together you know, <laughs> together. So that that puts me. That puts me until June, and then hopefully in June things will settle down, and I can, I can re reestablish myself. Uh, yeah, and, um, great. And yeah, and I also am um, pushing a book. You guys, if, yeah, if you have any two. teachers you have two out books, there, right? yeah, I have a few. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been I've been fortunate to work with some great people that uh, see the same uh, idea that that teaching yoga isn't. Um, 
isn't for intuitive and, and something that happens off the cuff. It needs to be presented in, in a linear fashion. So I put together a book called um, Shanga Shvedyaya, you know, self-study book. Yeah. Uh, and it's, a, it's more of a journal than an actual book, book with um, primary, second series, often is in there. The, the typical chance you'll learn while your first year in India, uh, the, <laughs> the count for first and second series, the sutras and the, the mm -hmm. traditional pranayama. So not only Amazing. for only nineteen ninety nine on Amazon, <laughs> can you buy a book, <laughs> teach yourself that. And I can save you a whole trip to India. So right. you know, that's, that's thousands of dollars, <laughs> four grand, four grand yeah. to go to India, you know, nice. Uh -oh. Not yeah, full bad. teacher training for 1999. That's amazing. <laughs> it's so good. Save the year of your life. I love it. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we'll put the links. Play. Yeah, we'll put the links in the show notes. And you could even just buy the book and take it to India with you. <laughs> That's right. Then you'd have like the Coles notes to your experience. What are you actually <laughs> learning while you're there? You can make notes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And people can find your schedule on your website. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I annoyingly post it almost daily uh, on there <laughs> with, uh, yeah, with, with, with the dates. And uh, I'm always, you know, I, I love being in a room full of like-minded people. And, yeah. and I, everywhere I go, I'm just really just honored uh, and flabbergasted. Really, I just stand by myself in these and look at these people. And man, I said, there's a room full of badasses. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I get that. so excited. I like, holy cow, these these people work their asses off, and it's yeah. it, it's a group of dynamic that I love being around. Yeah. It really is nice. Gorgeous, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for thank hanging out with us today. Do you feel stuck in a cycle of working twenty four seven without seeing real results? Do you wish someone would just come in and tell you, do this first, do this second, and you're going to have amazing results? Did you know that seven out of 10 small businesses fail? That is not your future. It is 100% possible to have the freedom and the health and the time for yourself and your family and make the money that you want to make that's going to give you freedom, stability, flexibility, and experience all the goodness your heart is craving. You can study and learn from Marie Forleo in this three-day dream business boot camp. She is an entrepreneur that built a multi-million dollar empire from the ground up, starting with nothing, no investors, just herself. And she's here to give you the strategies and the roadmap to bring your passion, your dreams, your business to life. You don't need to be everywhere all the time. You don't need to be doing funny dances on social media. You need to just know how to really connect and create real connection with your clients, with your followers, with the people who need you the most. And this Dream Business Bootcamp is going to help you figure out how to do that. So if you have at all an interest, a dream in your heart that you would like to bring into the world, even if you're not sure what your business might be, even if it's just an inclination of, I have this idea and I'd like some support in manifesting it. I'd like to know some steps to help me start moving the dial forward to get there. Be sure you join this free offering. It's awesome. It's incredible. It's three days, the Dream Business Boot Camp with Marie Forleo, my personal business mentor. She's so much fun. These, It's such a fun three days with her, and I hope that you join. It's amazing. So jump in today, find the links in the show notes or on my Instagram profile, Harmony Slater Official, and I look forward to seeing you there. That's it. We've concluded another episode of the Finding Harmony podcast. I just want to thank you so much for doing the work that changes the world, starting with yourself. It truly does make a huge difference. Please make sure you have your automatic downloads turned on wherever you listen so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. I have so much more magic I can't wait to share with you. Lastly, if you're on Instagram, I love connecting and hearing from you. So come on over and say hello at Finding Harmony Podcast. 
And you can also come say hello to me personally at Harmony Slater Official. Thank you again for being here. I cannot wait to share more with you in our next episode.